one day you wake up and you're like 55 years of age and it's all gone. It's like on the rear view mirror, you know what I'm saying? It's been a nice trip, but it's like uh, now what? Doctor, that's the reason I came to see you. I mean, you're a psychologist, right? I mean, why would you put yourself in harm's way like that? Well, it's a steel cage match. Where are you supposed to go? <laughs> it's really what it's all about. You know, the people want to yell, they want to cheer, they want to boo, they want the blood, sweat, and tears, man. You know what I'm saying? But you tell them, look, I'm from Pittsburgh, a former altar boy. You're a father of two young lads. Why would you want to put yourself in that situation? I don't know. What's the reason I'm here? I want to go back to that situation. Yeah. <laughs> now what? You know, I'm always scheming in the pro wrestling, you know. I was going to join the WWF and become famous. My name is Sky Osoya. I am the New York City three-time Golden Gloves boxing champion, the Empire State champion, and the USA National Women's Boxing Champion. You know, I got a demo tape together. Three Golden Gloves. And I mailed it out to WWF, which is now WWE. 1995, 96. And uh, nobody called me. I kept trying, I would send it out every month, different person, different name. And finally, one day somebody did call me and they said, we got your package, you look good. If we're interested, we'll give you a call. Rest enhancements really do help any, any kind of entertainment business, trust me. Whether you're a dancer, a professional wrestler, or a wrestling dom or a dominatrix, you yeah, a boob job. Steroids. Yeah, you know, hey, I did it, I'd do it again. You do what you have to do to be successful. Always scheming, still scheming. Any chance. My name is Larry DeGarris. I'm uh, an academic. Degree is a PhD in sport, leisure, and exercise science. I would say my dual areas of specialization are sport marketing and uh, sport sociology. Originally from New Jersey and now moving to Pullman, Washington to work as an assistant professor of sport management at Washington State University. I read a paper criticizing Japanese theater that there's no more key, it's inner energy in performance in theater anymore. Actors used to be able to evoke tears in the audience just from their presence. You know, that skill is gone. I say, well, obviously these people have never been to a wrestling match. I'm Johnny Valiant, alias Tom Sullivan. Tom Sullivan, alias Johnny Valiant. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Grew up in Pittsburgh. I still have family in Pittsburgh, a mother, and I have a son in Pittsburgh, and a son in San Diego. I have three grandchildren. 
and they know that I'm Tom Sullivan. You know, I'm not really Johnny Valiant to them. I have a Pennsylvania driver's license. So uh, all things being equal, I'm still a Pennsylvania resident, but I happen to live in New York City. Same thing I did in the ring. I'm incorporating in the acting business, comedy business. I don't need applause. I, I really don't. I mean, you can applaud a little bit if you want. I mean, it would hurt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Johnny Valiant. Johnny Valiant. Yeah, I'm going to tell you the reason I'm here. Here we go. Here we go. Since the hieroglyphics of wrestling have brought much of Johnny Valiant back to New York City by way of Ohio. Wow. I'm scouting here, man. That's what brings the luscious one, Johnny B. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Let me tell you something, Valiant. I've been here going on nine years in New York and enjoying probably everything in as much as in professional wrestling. Wow! A reversal into a rear hammerlock. Wow. Rear hammerlock. Masters of the hammerlock. Rear, rear, and a reversal. Rear hammerlock. Wow! A challenge I like. Rear hammerlock. Another hammerlock. I, again, adjust like I did with different opponents to different uh, directors and just going with the flow. How I got out of wrestling first place was, uh, you know, you could kind of see the writing on the wall. All right, that's it. That's the end of my humor. I'm done. I got to be in bed by 10 o'clock. I got to be home. I got things to do. You weren't being used as often, and uh, I wasn't on the booking sheets to appear any longer. Welcome to Jersey City. Happy your uh, announcer tonight. Of course, I am, and the one and the only Johnny Valiant from the uh, WWF. I was managing Beefcake and Valentine. They went to Vince McMahon, and they wanted to kind of do single matches. You're going to be seeing a battle royal tonight in Jersey City. That left me free, free to be kind of let go. Those phone calls, they do always catch you at the wrong time, then you got to make decisions. I had a powwow with Vince, and I thanked him. Thanks for the opportunity. Funny, because I had just been granted custody with my two sons, and now I a new house that I purchased in Pittsburgh uh, was under peril there because the, the money wasn't coming in. So I had to uh, put that up for sale and uh, had to move in back into my mother's house with my two teenage kids. But it was very disappointing, obviously. Rearing my kids and getting them off to school was, and being there for them was a lot more important than being on the road as a wrestler. So. That job at Saks Fifth Avenue came along. And being back into that nine to five world as a store detective in Pittsburgh for three and a half years. Then I was in Long Island doing a wrestling match and I met a guy, uh, Mike Kimmel. And he uh, approached me with being an actor. Oh, you'd be a natural for this business. I'd never, ever, ever thought of it. I'll tell you what, if anybody thinks I'm coming out of retirement, they're crazy. I see those young guys there, what they do? Forget about it. Pushing a mop or a broom or a salesman or whatnot, or security. All nice jobs, all honest jobs. But uh, they weren't for me as it turns out. My name is Sky Ho Soya, and I am a professional wrestler. Safa, you give up now? Huh? No. No. I go by the name Empress Asia, sometimes Sky Samurai. <laughs> I also work as a wrestling dominatrix when I'm not in the squared circle. It's like a fetish that not too many women can do, but it's high demand. Smother him with feet. I have beautiful feet, eh? Give the claw! Wrestling is the greatest sport ever invented by mankind. Just by watching that, you should be doing this. I mean, Asia's very good, so I enjoy wrestling, but it was like the third or fourth time we've actually 
wrestles and everything. She's very uh, technical. She knows how to apply the holes and things like that. Looking forward to it, so it should be an interesting tag team matchup. <laughs> exactly. Starts with a cucumber mud pack <laughs> and ends with a pedicure at Fleur. Most of them are upper echelon executive types because you have to have money to do this, and we deliberately keep the price high to weed out the uh, undesirables. I've done a gamut of wrestling styles. I'm sorry about that. Okay. We've done a bikini wrestling, oil wrestling. A couple of guys even actually like the pro theme wrestling. I even made a uh, card up. He used to call himself the Bandit, so it was the Bandit versus Asia. And I, you know, put it up on the wall and he'd wear his little wrestling outfit and I'd wear my little wrestling outfit. He would actually give me money to hire an audience. I pay them to sit and watch us wrestle. Here I go. I gotta go it's over up here. to the money guy. You know the guy. It says fantasy. So uh, we'll see what he wants. Boom. And that was one of the most uh, bizarre pro wrestling gigs that I did. Knee back all the way. Get your hips up now. Keep those hips up when you fall. Yeah, I still kind of felt right. Um, you know, this is something very special for somebody. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm making his fantasy come true. What are they called? The Geisha Girls? Yeah, the uh, Geisha Girls. Wrestling Geisha. Wrestling Geisha Girls. The Towers of Terror versus Wrestling Geisha. You can feel free to take it off, but okay. I, I'm concerned about your elbow there, you know. I got hurt yesterday, and if, it, if it's sensitive, I don't want you to. The Land of the Rising Sun, Tokyo, Japan. Wow. <laughs> I went to college here in New York City, the uh, famous Parsons School of Design, and uh, I started taking up bodybuilding because I felt bodybuilding was art. It's living sculpture. Because I grew up in New York City where women are very free and liberal, when I went back to Japan, I was surprised to see that women are still a second-class citizen back there. There are not many women bodybuilders or any women in the hardcore uh, gyms they would treat me like a pussy. But I was a serious athlete, and I pulled my weight, and I actually trained with some of the Japanese champions over there. Uh, the Japanese style wrestling, they take that as like a national sport, being number two after sumo. If I started then, my life would have been different. I would have probably been somebody by now. But at that time, I thought it was hokey and it was just something to watch. I was into my bodybuilding. And I think I really got into the bodybuilding over there to Squeeze him, yeah. express yeah. my empowerment as a woman. And it really did fuel everything that followed afterwards, including the work that I do with the wrestling, applying it to dominating and dominating men. I was probably 10. I uh, go to a friend's house and we try and stay up until midnight to watch the uh, old IWA, which was the first syndicated wrestling show. And I liked it, but I didn't watch it every week, and I wouldn't say I was a, a huge fan. We're coming up on five minutes of action. I keep it simple. This is my bag. Boots, towel, tights, hood. Never know when you need it. You know, plastic bottle. A little professional courtesy, but also 
it's mostly just alcohol, like most aftershave, so it protects against skin diseases. So I was in college, say, 83, 84, when uh, Snooker really started to take off in the WWF. And I started to follow it again. By that time, I was a collegiate wrestler. So I think I looked at it a little bit differently. More of an appreciation of what they do, what they go through. Around the time, too, I said, you yeah, know, that might be something fun to do. But, and, you know, Jimmy is older now, but he's a legit athlete. The, the newer guys don't have the athletic background. You look at the matches tonight, you know, besides me and Jimmy, try and find one legit tough guy on the whole card. But that's kind of typical, though, for guys who go into the business. You know, you work a lot with guys you used to watch on TV. There's JB. I was in commercial yesterday. Good. Yeah. Yeah, they wrapped me at about 5 o'clock for uh, Vivident chewing gum. They're gonna show it. They're gonna show it in Italy. Played a garbage man. Okay. I loved it. Some of my students said they're coming tonight. Are they? Yeah, they're gonna make the trip. Would you believe that? Why not? I said no extra credit. Yeah. Lunch in the city. I go to the Senior Citizen Center on West 49th Street, St. Malachy's, and I get a beautiful lunch for 75 cents. I'm the youngest guy there at 52. Then I go hit the gym either before or afterwards. I go to mass. I go wait for the beeper to go off. I go on auditions. I go read for this and that. Send out a few postcards and settle. And sit there with some of the actors and talk. We all have our ear to the ground and do some brainstorming. And there's a pretty decent camaraderie there. Larry, this car's riding smooth, isn't it? Yeah, better be. Beautiful. Well, it's going to be for sale soon. I go to a conference and I sit down and talk about Franz Fanon. I'll talk about uh, Bourdieu. I'll talk about Roland Barthes. I present papers dealing with postmodern cultural theory and ethnographic epistemology, you know, intellectual stuff. It's funny because I get in the ring and I maybe rough somebody up. This is the, this is the locker room, guys. And people say, man, you know, Larry, I can't imagine you in front of a classroom. If I go to a, an academic conference, I'm the wrestler. In a locker room, I'm the professor. And you want to ask me who's the real Larry, which is more uh, authentic. Roland Barthes' paper on wrestling. Pretty famous for being one of the first things written about wrestling by a serious critic. His major point was that what wrestling signifies is very clear and direct. All the, the signification is just right there for you. Two figures engaged in combat. I mean, that's a classic image, and that's something that anybody can understand anywhere in the world. Wrestling matches like theater, it's like drama, it's like human chess. It's all pantomime. You can just tell. The movements are exaggerated. You don't go like this, like you would in boxing, where it's just a short punch and you could really knock someone out. You wind up and throw it. Shoot. 
you need to make sure that the person in the last row sees the right hand. These guys move a lot better than I ever did when I began. The one guy with the mohawk haircut, you know, he uh, he's already developed a persona. The audience is uh, responding to him, but now they're looking at him for his arresting ability, of which he does have some. It's there, whether he knows it or not. Referee has declared this match a draw. Jazz is up. And 'm um, basically a Confucianist when it comes to epistemology. It's simple. Five thousand years ago, Confucius said, "To know that you know what you know and do not know what you do not know. That's true knowledge.) <laughs> Certain things you can see, certain things you can't. What's wrong, and the trick is in knowing the difference, where to draw the line. Okay, what do I know? Well, I know that this guy fell down, but I don't know, did he fall down or was he knocked over? You can't tell. And then you ask the guys, and even then you can't tell. You ask one guy, did you fall down to where you knocked over? He said, no, the motherfucker knocked me over, man. And then you ask the other guy, did you knock him over? No, he fell. I was real light. <laughs> what postmodernists are saying now is nothing new. The truth is, is fleeting. You know, that it's, it's hard to, to grasp. This is what's so fun and, and playful about the business. drive away from there, we see the World Trade Center heading out in here in the, in the Jersey. I guess it's right around 17, exit 17. I'll be looking for it, 31 South, Flemington. I never thought about acting when I was here years ago, wrestling in New York on top in the garden and all these places. I never, I never dreamed of it. I never knew you go on auditions and you get eight by 10 pictures and you get agents and what the agents do and what do the casting directors do and production offices and doing extra work and voiceovers and, and all this stuff. I, I didn't know what the heck that was, you know. My casting director friend, Shirley Sender, she said, Johnny, you remind me of Brian Dennehy. I don't know about that. I, there's no way I could, I, I don't know. I could maybe attempt it, but it would, I don't know. I don't know if I can remember the lines. <laughs> that guy can. That guy's just incredible. Brian Dennehy is Hulk Hogan. The, the tonight's not a comedy club per se. Tonight's a, it's at a high school, to the best of my my knowledge. I, I don't know what the hell I'm getting into. Probably at this uh, juncture, I would think that uh, Uncle Floyd would be the headliner. He's a big name here around New Jersey, New York. Graduate of Juilliard. I know Larry Zabrisco and I think Freddie Blassie, and they, uh, they used to be on his show years ago, so looking forward to it. I don't like that. 
before used to always be, are you a wrestler? Now it's just... I have my shot. Have a great time. Here's a program if you'd like to take one. Explains a little about the entertainers. I would like to get the kind of feel of the town. I can pick up, pick up on some local humor, you know? I hate to rush. I'm, I'm a funny guy. I hate, I hate to rush. If I had my own wheels, I would have been here this afternoon, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, walking around, having coffee, get the field to join, you know? The town. That's all I do. I was even the same way in wrestling. Wrestling, you know, uh, you, you get out there and you talk about it, you know, uh, it, people have a conceived notion of it anyhow, but you kind of give them a little peek at behind the scenes. Poking fun at oneself wouldn't be too bad. You know, professional wrestling, you know, after the 30 some plus years that I've been involved in it, there's a lot to poke fun at. I was always the bad guy in wrestling. I don't know why, but uh, I always had the people booing me. And I never really wanted to be the bad guy, you know. I, well, I wanted to be the good guy. When I had the long, flowing, bleach blonde hair and the dark sunglasses and the fancy uh, jackets, maybe I kind of paved the way along with my brother Jimmy Valiant uh, for some of the characters you see today. He is totally no stranger, no throughout Western Jersey, Eastern Jersey, Uncle Floyd! I don't know how you determine or what determines success. In my uh, humble opinion, it certainly is how much, not how much money you have in a bank. All my coins heat up on the dashboard, they get hot like rivets. <laughs> certainly is no indication of me as a man by what title precedes my name, you know, is it Dr. Johnny Valiant? Special Envoy Johnny Valiant, or State Supreme Court Justice Johnny Valiant, or, or, or Inmate Valiant. Hold that tiger, hold that tiger, hold that tiger, yeah. Where's that tiger? Where's, even the Barney song has better lyrics. <laughs> I think a successful person is somebody doing what they have a passion for. From the World Wrestling Federation, I'm Luscious Johnny Valiant. Thank you so very, very much for coming out and have a safe trip home. Thanks once again, Flemington, New Jersey. Good night. God bless. Well, that's it. Yeah, pretty good. Well, good. There were some funny guys there, weren't there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah really. Uncle Floyd, he was something, wasn't he? He's great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming out. Okie dokie. Floyd left, man. I wish I was going down the fucking road, man. I was about three years old. We worked our way in through um, Hawaii. That's the way most of the Japanese immigrants came in back in the day. My ancestors backed me up through the shrine. I'm out of candles, but at least light an incense. So before I go out to do a wrestling match or a, a boxing match, I would pray, light a candle, and they come through the channel and they back me up and they give me the strength. At least that's what I believe.
This is Kanon. This is Buddha disguised as a woman so women wouldn't feel awkward to confess or talk to him. This is my family. This was when I won the Golden Gloves. My mother, my sister, my brother. My mother is real cool. Uh, she knows what I do. She knows I do the pro wrestling. She knows I do the Dom stuff. And this one is my father, my sister, my brother. We're in Chinese New Year. My father doesn't know that. He thinks I'm a personal trainer or, you know, I just tell him what I do for the daytime. You know, what, what all ex-wrestlers and fighters do, we teach. I teach the cardio kickboxing, boxing, a body sculpt at all the top New York City gyms. Walk into any of these gyms, ask for Sky, there I am. Three times. Three is lucky number in Japan. Actually, I'm quite lucky because my folks, they ran away from Japan because they didn't want to be cookie cutter. They didn't want to fit into the beehive. My brother's a suit. He works for a bank slash stock company. My sister's a nurse. My sister and my brother know. They love me, so they accept it. They just say, please don't talk about it when we have company. Friday, 7, 09 p.m. I'm calling by an inquiry about a serious, very sadistic wrestling match. Um, my fantasy is I would like to wear high heels, higher the better, and I want to be knocked out of them, have the heels broken, you know, everything. Um, like no, I came back to New York from Japan. I didn't have a job, and I had to get a job before my mother saw that I was unemployed. So I started looking through the New York Times, and it said, wanted athletic women to do phone work. A few columns down, it said, women wanted as wrestlers will train, and it was the same number. And it turns out it was like a wrestling female phone line. Hi, this is Asia. You want to know how big my biceps are? My biceps are 14 inches. I'm gonna get you in a headlock. Oh yeah, I'm punching you now. Ooh, 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 now I got you. Hip toss, ooh, you're on the floor. I'm gonna pile drive you, ooh, ooh. Okay, uh, so what's your name? I'm um, Brian. Um, do you have a ring? We don't have a ring. It's like a large bedroom. No furniture, wall to wall mat. And you can flip and you know, that type of thing? Yes, I'm a professional, licensed professional wrestler, yeah. So you want, you want the wrestling in the high heels. Okay. All right, so Brian, when you're ready, give us a call. To become a Bring true good phone wrestler, okay, I had to learn the terminology, <laughs> the actual grunts and sounds of wrestling. So I wound up at the world famous Gleason's at Johnny Rod's uh, wrestling school. Back then, Gleason's was still old and run down and not too many people knew about it. This is the old dog himself, Johnny Rods. And this was back in the beginning, my gosh, 1994, 93. Yeah, he was still young and strong then. One, Jimmy yeah, the kids coming up then was Tommy Dreamer, Taz, Devon Dudley, Bad Billy Walker, Java Chabibi, Larry Briscoe. We all came up together. We were just taking our roll downs and rolls up at the time. Just a bunch of kids. My first workout, we start off with the falls. Roll up, roll downs, and the, and the slap outs. If you can't get past that slap out or the fall, you can't be a wrestler. I went home with whiplash. And Johnny Rod said, I'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, I don't think so. And that's where most people end. You know, they don't come back. Crippled, whiplash and all, I came back. And I think that's when I won the respect from John. He was like, hey, Japanese girl, you're back. Yeah. When I graduated from college, the first job that I had was as a high school teacher. And I had a student whose dad was one of the lumberjacks. I said, ask your dad, you know, how do you break into the business? And she said, he told me to tell you to go see Johnny Rods. And then I went down and visited the school and liked what I saw, that it was serious and that Johnny himself was in the ring with the guys. And I signed up.
everybody there is weightlifting, steroid type guys. And you walk in, you're just like a kind of a normal looking guy. And they figure, oh, this guy's a pussy. You know, until they try you. And then they're like, wait a second. When I started out, Larry was like Johnny's right hand man. He was the professor, exactly. He said, rule number one, protect yourself. Rule number two, protect your partner. <laughs> he was serious, but he was a little bit of a clown. You know, and to this day, I really don't know what he does for work. He says, guy, you don't know me. And I said, yeah, I guess I don't. But all I know is that he's a great uh, wrestling instructor. We were all young, we were wolves, and uh, yeah, he had this beat up old Ford or something, and the, the ceiling was coming down, and the rust, like you can put your finger out the door. Uh, yeah, he'd drive me home sometimes. I don't know, I think in the beginning, I think he used to have a little crush on me. But then, you know, it was a guy's gym, it was Gleason's gym. I was like one of the only girls there back in the day, you know. My father was a blue collar kind of guy, painting contractor, and had a series of fleet of trucks and uh, would paint the uh, Giant Eagle supermarkets and the AMP. Well, the first time sitting down having to watch pro wrestling, I, I was with my father watching WIIC TV, um, Channel 11. One of the most popular wrestlers to perform on this arena. Arm takedown, a nice hold by Bill and a head... It's all like a local type Leo wrestling, so when guys like Edouard Compartier would come in there and do that big backflip off the top rope or whatever, that was a big thing. Now they're beginning to slug it up. Gorilla Monsoon and Wild Red Berry and Killer Kowalski and Waldo Von Erich and all these other guys. I said, holy oh, man. I was just all of all these people. I even got my hair cut once in a real short crew cut because of Waldo Von Eric. I kind of liked the way he was so, so arrogant and whatnot. But then I, I was kind of drawn towards guys like Buddy Rogers and Johnny Valentine with that long blonde hair and real tan physiques and hey daddy O and all this stuff. I, said, I never heard anybody ever talk that way. And the Pittsburgh Pirates, when they were ever interviewed, they never spoke it like that. My brother one day came in and said, hey, this guy that I met at the supermarket, he said he's going to be on wrestling tonight. And it was Bruno San Martino. He uh, came from the old country from Italy and uh, moved into the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, where the University of Pittsburgh is situated. And so they called him the Oakland Strongman, and he was a very strong guy and whatnot. Wow, look at that guy. He was the hometown favorite, later to be a world champion and a big celebrity nationwide. He moved up by me a few streets from uh, where I lived. I just went up, knocked on his door, introduced myself to him, and uh, yeah, he was quite nice. He gave me a schedule as to how to lift weights and that, and show me some holds and whatnot. And, yeah, he was very supportive, and he was kind of a hero to me, you know. Little did I know that years and years ahead that I'd be in the same business with people like that and travel with them and even wrestling them. Totally unbelievable. Totally unbelievable. In the past few years now, there's been a really tremendous upsurge of independent promotion. Where someone buys a ring and a pair of tights and boots and you're a wrestler. I think though when you see kind of a legitimate pro in the ring, you can see how out of place these other guys are. These are the heaviest things, everything else is light. 
mid 70s, there were 25 territories in the U.S. and Puerto Rico where you could go to wrestle full time. There's no school. The way you learn was you'd get in the ring and wrestle guys who are more experienced every night. So you're better schooled in the fundamentals. Yeah, it hit a peak, you know. Summer's only slower. Yeah, but it was, it was a fever for you know for a while, and, you know, where as long as it was just anything wrestling was hot, and, and now it's kind of coming back down to earth. And stuff. Well, but it's always been that way. Yeah, look at the 80s, you know, 50s it was hot and it was too much hot. See, I was lucky because when I came up, things were starting to die down, but there were still different places around the country that you can go and wrestle. The AWA was still going in Minnesota. You know, there was still a promotion in Georgia, and Tennessee was running okay. There were still these old timers, the veteran guys, they were still around. So I had an opportunity to wrestle Bob Orton Jr., Greg Valentine, Johnny Valiant, Nikolai Volkov. I wrestled Ivan Koloff. Uh, Jimmy Snuka five years ago when he could really move a lot better. You know, I learned more in one night wrestling these guys than I did in a year training. Come on! They, you know, they, they might as well be in Madison Square Garden. These guys. They have to be calmed down. The guys coming up now don't have that opportunity, very few. And the old timers who are around are really at the tail end of their careers. And there's a big difference. You know, there's a big difference. Let's go get a chili dog. Well, China's a real wrestler. Come on, baby. You know, and then she was working with Vince in WWF. They probably you get tough put her through the ringer. Yeah. You get tough in this sport. You get tough. I've done shows where the scouts have come out to the shows and they've seen me in my gimmick and my costume. I believe that uh, they took my idea, my costume, my image for China. Take your head off. China, Asia, Asia, China. Oh, they get that look in their eye when they're on top and they know that me and him are the only one in the apartment. And what do you do? I knee him in the groin. Hard or just... Real gonna... hard. But you got to make it like it was an accident, like, uh, uh, boom. Oh, I'm sorry. Water break. So if you don't wait to say, hey, come on, that's it. No, because no. Because that'll they're... give them a chance to lock up and they'll think you're afraid. No. You cannot show fear. You cannot show fear. Would you wrestle for me tonight? Sure, I'll wrestle. It's already working, right? <laughs> it's like a salt and pepper shaker set. Nobody wants a salt shaker alone. You need the pepper. And you're with Destiny. Destiny's with you. You need somebody to work with. This is Sky Shadow, correct? Yes, it is. Sky Shadow. My first match. Wow, I, sh I should have kept the ticket stuff for that, right? One of the local shows in the Bronx or something. Fan favorite, for sure. With Jeannie, who came into the wrestling school eventually. Cowgirl out, I guess. I think I paid a buck and a quarter. And they paid me the last bits in coins, actually. Uh, Double bicep pose, Lou. She's mm. pointing to you. The uh, door didn't do so. <laughs> yeah, I think that was my first match. Wouldn't put a rake of the eyes or anything like that, or a quick kick. Oh, and an A. We're underway. Jeannie was my arch nemesis on stage, but she was my partner backstage. Sky Shadow versus Sweetness today. Yeah, easy enough. We got the same okay. old referee. Yeah, I I saw, it's I like fucking deja vu. It's like deja vu. It was like 10 years ago. Same oh, thing. We're Nothing's go changed. We worked together for a while. <laughs> different costume, different state, same same shtick. Oh, look at that. Here we go. I was over at Johnny Rod's training, and then this classy, elegant, charming, Older guy walks in. Good to see you. you look great. Thank you. Feel free. You look like a gentleman. Uh, well, I'm trying my best. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know that was Johnny Valley. Took me a while to get used to him. 
me years to get into SAG, and once you do get in, boy, it sure narrows things down. A lot of my friends are working under, you know, oh, you know, names. sure, yeah, uh -huh. hell what, uh, you know, yeah. you gotta pay the rent. I mean, yeah. union's great and everything, but what about your rent? He started telling me and giving me hints food? on how I don't need to be too loud pay. because I'm the, I'm the dirty Jap, and Japs are, and they do. Oh, I know he kind of molded my character, you know, you know I, I guess as a, as a heel. guy told me once, he says, you go to L.A., John, you'll come back and you'll, you'll think wrestling's real. We've become actually quite good friends, and uh, I've known him for like four years now exactly. on strange occasions. You get by, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there, what are you going to do? We're talking about New York compared to L.A., you know? Well, multiple layer New York City. One single layer LA. I got some chocolate vinaigrette there. I have some muffin. I have some beautiful uh, chicken. I forgot the chicken. Uh, yeah. These are the envelopes. If uh, you haven't figured out by now, tonight there's a stack of them. If this show doesn't make money, it's my fault. The boys get paid. If we make a fortune, I make a fortune. But the boys get paid all the time. That's why the envelopes are paid the night before the show. I either sink or I swim. We'll see what happens tonight. I'll talk to you later. It's almost like a, an old-time cowboy movie where you would see the bad guy and the other guy's trying to get his way up on the cliff. The bad guy's stomping his fingers. And... With professional wrestling, you don't necessarily have to be a good athlete. Bret Hart said he had to take all the old wrestlers, take them out back and shoot them. I think he's right. <laughs> It's more about the show. It's the entertainment. It's it's the characters. I think you fall in love with. Okay, so talk the whole shtick again. Let's go. Okay. You're not allowed to talk when you're a baseball player. With the wrestling, you you can plead your case. So you guys do your mic work. It's important to mic work. You can play. He's not gonna play. Can you say nothing but a win? You play up that alter ego, and I think that's what people watch. Now I think that Crazy Ivan has got an Italian accent, so I don't know if he's Irish, Italian, or German. Ox has to notice that this man may have a foreign accent. Well, when you go out there and you're doing a show, you got to stay in character, whether you make a mistake or not. And you just go out there, you wing it. Sure, once in a while there's a mistake and uh, you'll get a boot in the face. But for the most part, you protect each other, you protect your partner. Really, to be honest with you, the audience doesn't know. They don't know what you have in your mind. So if you miss a spot or something, it's not a problem. Sometimes we've worked and people have yelled at us and said, boo, boring, boring. You know, you ignore them. They'll get back with you, they'll get back with you. One of the wonderful things about wrestling, it's, it's live, one time. Get it right, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we will have a brief intermission. The champ right here, it's me. Get a magic marker there. We got autographs, we got t-shirts. You give rub downs, we comb your hair, brush your teeth. You, you stay tuned for Wrestling Cake Production. Oh, I shouted so much out. You took care of child. Sure, you can go to Uganda with me. Do you have a big hut there? I have a big hut. A big hut? I, I bet you hut. have a big hut. I think it's a gift to have a sense of humor. Uh, I had got a laugh album, a Jonathan Winters album. You know, this guy would make noises, you know, and do things like, like a flying saucer or whatever. Hey, why do you say? You know, and do voices or and, 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 and I would listen to this over and over for hours and hours. And, just, and I, I would incorporate that, you know, in school. <laughs> well, I used to drink because I was in the business. And I drank because I wasn't in the business. <laughs> I used to drink because I was on the road all the time. 
and I went because I wasn't on the road and all the time. It's funny, <laughs> funny how you get used to, to being on the road all the time. My friend, yeah. Miss Lipstitz, she wasn't too happy with me because I would cause commotion. While well, science class is going on or math class, it's not exactly the best time to do that. So I guess I kind of lagged behind and I didn't do all that good. But I chose to go to Atlantic City to work in front of the steel pier and the boardwalk rather than repeating uh, summer school. My mother and I were food shopping and uh, Mr. Gillespie, who was a butcher, said, that, why doesn't uh, Tom go to the uh, school that my son goes to in Virginia, a military school? So they dropped me off. And then they, they left and left me there. Well, I was very homesick. Here's this Waynesboro, Virginia, a real sleepy little town. I'd never really been away from home all that much, of course, Atlantic City and all, but I mean, I, I knew I was coming home. Uh, not that I felt that I had made a mistake, but it's like, what the heck did I do? I should have went to English class. I should have went to summer school. So I was on the Fishburne uh, military uh, football team, and uh, so was Vince McMahon. He was on the wrestling team. I was on the basketball team. We were on the same baseball team together. He was very self-assured of himself. Not arrogant, but close to it, like he didn't really answer to anybody. One day, we were supposed to go to a uh, parade. We were too smart for them. Why would we want to do that? So he and I, and I think one or two other guys, decided that we're going to go up on top of the roof where they had the flags and all this. Went up there and just took a tan, you know, and worked out and stuff, and had look at all the other guys marching out in the heat and doing their military formations, and uh, we got busted, and I got kicked out of the school for that. They came back down from Pittsburgh in the car and picked me up, took me home, and I shook hands with Vince, and I was kind of teared up a little bit. Maybe he was, and too, and, uh, and that was uh, the last I was to see Vince McMahon. So I thought. I always got interesting when somebody uses a sport metaphor for another field. So here's uh, somebody who wrote about Kafka and Pinter and calls it shadow boxing, the struggle between father and son. So in the past few years, I've become a student when I started really writing about it. Down, same old, wondering what's going to happen next. Here they are manipulating. There goes Chicago with a backflip. Once more, so to do. And when you're trying to learn a craft, it helps to know the history of how people used to do things. As they're near the ropes, got a half Nelson on them now. Referee's got to watch every move, walk around. It's funny, I don't think wrestling was ever a shoot. Right, as a scientist, you're, you're trained always to be skeptical. Show me the, the evidence. Wrestling's always been a business, and it's always been about making money. If the sport ever got in the way of that, then they would have to change the sport, and that's the direction that it went in. If you ever see a real wrestling match, you'd have two guys locked up for five hours, and after five hours, maybe one guy would win. buy a ticket for that. It's not very exciting for fans to watch. So if you look at professional basketball, all the rules have been changed in order to accommodate television and spectator interest. So if you wanted to parallel that to wrestling, pro wrestling is like a Harlem Globetrotters version of uh, the sport of wrestling. Bottom line is the bottom line. If you don't make money, you don't have a show. But certainly in, in medieval times, the joust was a work. I mean, it was a spectacle and it was stage managed, you know, for entertainment purposes and discourse as performance. It moved from patronage to uh, ticket selling.
so pro wrestling, I think, uh, kind of indirectly comes out of that lineage. It's kind of funny, you know, I read uh, about like, prize fighters. And that's supposed to be the golden age, where it's pure. And John L. Sullivan was uh, a theatrical performer. He toured in burlesque houses. And wrestling was the same way. Frank Gotch toured in burlesque houses. Has it changed that much? Okay, so uh, today we're way downtown in the meatpacking district in a club that they're volunteered to rent out for wrestling tonight. You know, wow party, women's only wrestling. I found out about it because uh, I ran into one of my girls who goes by the name of Crimson. She really likes to do wrestling personally for herself. What I've been trying to do is draw women out to explore their physicality. And so I've been throwing these parties and it can comprise of anything from erotic cat fighting where women rip off their clothes and, and you know, do all sorts of naughty things to really semi-competitive and pure physical domination. It's just such a thrill for me. And we got the mats, collegiate mats set up. It's, it's just playful, plus, you know, alcohol is being served, so you want to keep that into consideration. Everything should be kept on a playful, fun, you know, situation. Is that okay for you? I was the only girl at the wrestling school for seven years. I had to work out with the boys. Some of these guys are like 250 pounds. They're putting their hand between your legs and, and you know, pile driving you and hip tossing you and... She's serious. <laughs> I thought you were serious. I didn't know you can't take it sound. personally. You can't be a girly girl. Was I was never a girly girl. I was just one of the boys. There wasn't a lot of women wrestling, so I wrestled with a lot of men. And no one's really interested in getting seriously hurt. You know, stress yeah. relief. You don't make any money at it. It's strictly yeah, yeah, for it's, fun. You're doing it for sports. For so, I mean, if you were going to the next level, like professional wrestling, then that's a whole different routine, you know. But, we just try and stick to, you know, releasing some energy and having a little fun, that's all. Slammer, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know how to take your bumps? Come on. You can take your bumps? You can take your bumps. I remember a couple of summers back, the movie came out, Fight Club. So I guess in collegiate wrestling, I love us. Good move. It was just like that. It was called Dracool. In fact, it was in a sweatshop. Uh, they had a makeshift ring made out of like a rubber foam. I had wrestlers, wannabe wrestlers there. I had has-been boxers, boxers up and coming, changing their names, working. It was as close to Fight Club as you can get. One day, I decide that I'm gonna kick the weakest, goofiest looking person out of the audience and wrestle them. I guess he looked small to me at the time, but the guy was actually kind of buff and he was a little strong. I believe his name was Shaji. And the guy comes out of nowhere, bam! And my head goes snapping back and I'm grabbing it and I'm like, dude, this is, you know, this is like entertainment. You get it, right? Either he was drunk, he was high, he wasn't hearing me. My corner man says, yo, this guy's a freak, you gotta fuck him up. I hit him in the face and his eyes just turned around. Hi, hi, My flip him out of the ring, the ring was only yo big, and I sent him crashing into the audience. He seemed okay at the time. Like a few weeks later, I get a phone call from the Judge Mills Lane show, and they said that this guy wants to sue me because I hurt some spine in his neck or something. He was suing me for mental cruelty. Mental cruelty. Of course Judge Mill Lanes knows me. You know, I've met the man on the boxing circuit. So there I am on his show, and uh, Judge Mill Lane pointed his finger and said, you went into the wrestling ring and get a little sexual gratification. Shame on you, court dismissed. To this day, people stop me in the street. 
Is that going to be my wrestling claim to fame, the Judge Mills Lane show? Yeah, there's a submission hole. We're just going to go over the safety features once the real girls start coming in, how to fall. I'm going to keep this roll until 11 o'clock in the evening. Now you guys got to leave because you're men. <laughs> That's probably the greatest thing I ever did in my life, of course, you know, being a father, the most proud of, of all times of any somewhat meaningful accomplishments I ever had in my life. Yeah, one's in San Diego, he's 29, and the other one's uh, 27 in Pittsburgh. I would sometimes take him ever so often to the matches, certainly never let him in the dressing room and that. That was always like an off-limits for me. I was always kind of personal about my uh, family life. I'm kind of an open book myself, and but that part of my, my life, I kind of let them have their privacy. This is beat meditation, street regulation, underworld about to get play around the nation. This is the Louis Armstrong Middle School in Queens. I'm the school program chairman. This is beat meditation, street regulation, underworld. Evan would tell me about his wrestling newsletter and his radio show. I see people who I think really believe that these people are killing each other in the ring and it's for real. And here he said he could bring in guests and they would discuss it and they would say how it's rehearsed, how they practice it, that they, they know what's going to happen and it's not something you should do on your own. With all the bad press about kids doing terrible things, here's an opportunity to give them the truth. Remember Mike Leno? Mike Leno, yes. Yeah, he Is wants he from California. Yeah, he wants you to do his uh, radio show also. Oh, okay. I, I do radio too. But I'm, on, I'm on three in the morning, so but if you ever want to come, we'd love to have. You. Yeah, we're an arts program, not a wrestling show. So we have actors, improv comedians. Sopranos, I do that. Really? Yeah. Third Watch, SVU, Criminal Intent, riding around with guys like San Martino and Danucci and Aldemore and Lou Albano. I got my taste in the Sopranos right from the get-go. Right, right, right. So. I like kids a lot. Yeah, I was coaching American Legion baseball in Pittsburgh, so I, I do. I like I like kids. I like teenage kids. I like kids that are probably at that borderline. Okay, we have a WWF legend, two-time tag team champion, Johnny Valley, one of one of the great villains in the history of wrestling. Do you think Kurt Angle got to be as good as he is by just? Showing up? Yes. Oh, no. Yep. No. You think Kurt Angle put a lot of hard work? Yes. yes. He got smacked around a lot. Do you think you guys are going to get anywhere you want to be in life by not just showing up? Yes. Yep. When they say you have the will to win, that's not enough. You have to have the will to prepare to win. It's the time that you put at home, it's the time that the effort that you put on outside the classroom so that when you Some come Some of them are very attentive looking at you. Other ones, they're very disruptive. And their full intent and purpose is to, is to be disruptive. The guy we have right here, he needs a little Some of these kids, they really uh, shouldn't have a teacher. They should have a trainer. All I want him to be is a good boy. I wound up throwing an eraser at one of them, maybe. I don't know, or a piece of chalk. I, I really don't know. I, I tried to play off of them by showing them that I'm a little bit of a zany guy. And Johnny's going to grow to be an old man. But by the time I, uh, that magic wand, I let them know that enough's enough. Now, excuse me, let me talk, okay? I'm coming here at my own free will and giving my time for free so for you can be entertained. I know you have to use the restroom, but wait a minute. And the smarter you get, the more you're going to find out how much you don't know. But you'll always remember when Johnny Valiant told you that. Niggas slam dancing like they're about to bring war, but they don't want that. Bitches in the back row roll, catching the contact. Long rest, entrepreneur, about to lock that. Now, kids know a lot more than I ever know. In that, you know, life's a little bit more, not as simple, obviously. They're all good kids, and uh, hey, we got to support them because a lot of these young kids, they're out there in the front lines now over in the Middle East defending us, this nation, so. Thank you, thank you. Now, what question do you want to ask that question?
today we are at the Riverbank State Park. And uh, yeah, it's an incredibly beautiful venue. And the thing is, it looks like not too many people showed up, you know. It looks like there's actually there's more guardian angels and security out there than people. It doesn't matter. We play to a crowd of 10, play to a crowd of 10,000, play to any crowd, even one. That is where I met the smoke. Rising stars in sports and attempt today. And his partner Storm. For the smoke has spoken. How you like me now? The guy was a young wrestler, uh, a jabroni. He couldn't think of his own gimmick, so he was stealing the The Rock. I think a couple of wrestlers beat him up for that. Yo, come on, people, come up with your own ideas, you know? Come up with your own ideas. Oh, the wrestling game. <laughs> <laughs> we got three good looking sexy chicks to work the show today. And it's gonna be Sombra's first. I wanna make sure I catch that when she goes out. Let's we'll see what happens. The responsibility of wrestlers to children or the viewing public, I think, is greater than other sports. The kids look up to these people as our, you know, heroes. And I think what they see is going to be what they emulate. Brothers killing their own little sister by putting them in an atomic pile driver because he saw a wrestler do it on TV. We bleed ourselves with a, a gimmick, a little blade or a little ring. They take a shitloads of aspirin, thins the blood, you bleed for a long time. Barb wire matches and setting girls on fire. The kids are going to emulate that. The bookers and the producers, they just want more sex and more blood and more sex and more blood. You're going to make her step. Look what happened now. Look what you did. That was intentional. Guys, stop. Yo, this rules, man. We had her come in as a valet for Mr. Puerto Rico. It was a, a complete mark to wrestling. She didn't know anything about wrestling. And the kids, the little kids, they were groping her through the, the guardrail and grabbing her and groping her. She totally disgusted and she said, I will not support an industry that preaches sex and violence to children. And the funny thing is, she was like, she was a stripper. So. I told you we're coming for the gold. Tony Blaze, how does it feel to get shot? That needs to be fixed up a little bit. They really need to rethink what they're projecting as wrestlers.
Point Park College for about close to a year studying journalism and communications. And then I went to the Marines on a Paris Island, South Carolina. And then got out and went back uh, to Pittsburgh. And then I uh, went knocking on San Martino's door. I guess it was Bruno San Martino and Vince McMahon Sr. that uh, contacted a, uh, a notorious villain wrestler that had a ring in his backyard and that uh, they felt were pretty good friends with, the Sheik, the original Sheik, Eddie Farhat. Uh, at the ripe age, probably about 19, I, I started my pro wrestling career. I saw him as a youngster in Pittsburgh on television, and he was announced as uh, the Sheik from Beirut, Lebanon. I didn't know, ever heard of Beirut, Lebanon. What's, what is Beirut, Lebanon? What's a Sheik? Never spoke a word of English. And the authenticity of it all, there's nobody that doubted that the guy didn't have a camel double parked outside. I started out putting up the rings for this guy and refereeing. Al Costello, one of the wrestling uh, kangaroos, he's a world tag team champion guy, nice guy, Australian type. Uh, you know, he put me through the ropes and... Uh, he was the guy that started George Steele. Would kind of make you suffer, you know, and uh, stretch you, quote unquote, as we allude to it as, and... Um, didn't really hurt me, per se, but let me know that he could if he wanted to. Present you put this together. Oh. Keep it. Oh, man. Because a lot of my friends have asked me, they said, do you have any pictures? Uh, you know, would you believe I have maybe one or two? <laughs> John L. Sullivan, oh, that was the first name I used. One. Six years, maybe? After 30 years. Maybe seven years. That's Johnny Sullivan. Yeah, you've got some other territories. Boy, I should remember that one. Miami Orange Bowl. It was raining down there so much that time. I was always a good guy at that point. I was never a bad guy, never a villain. Always totally preliminary matches. Wrestled a little bit as best I could, paid my dues. Meager pay, you know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks a match or whatever. And living in YMCA's and third rate hotels and long trips and short money and very humbling type experience, but I was on my way as far as I know. A blind ambition. That's something to, to actually wrestle the guy that you knocked on his door when you, I mean, I guess I was about 14 when I first met Bruno. Right, right, right. One of my actor friends says, you realize if you would have never knocked on that man's door, your life would have been totally different. I mean, and as a result of doing that, do you, you know how your life totally changed? Well, that's what they say, your life could take different You know, I had gotten married, and uh, now I have a lot more to, to be more accountable for. Keeping two homes, you know, one on the road, and then sending money home for my wife to take care of the kids. Look at some of these guys here, like Bobby Duncan, Rocky Johnson, whose son is so famous now, The Rock, right? All of a sudden, after eight years, you get a break. Holy cats, 1974. Introducing. Yeah, introducing. Meet Luscious Johnny Valiant. Success does a lot of things to people. Uh, I saw it with Hogan, you, you certainly have seen it with McMahon. It's kind of parallel to the acting business. Uh, you know, Texas and Florida and Atlanta, Charlotte, North Carolina, Tennessee, Los Angeles and San Francisco. Just, you know, bouncing from territory to territory. up into Ontario, and that's where I met Jimmy Valiant. I was born in Tennessee, man, so I'm, I'm, I'm a southern boy, you know. I love it here, you know I'm back in the south. And we bought this little farmhouse out here in Shawsville, Indiana. Uh, Indiana, man. Uh, Shawsville, Virginia. You can tell I haven't slept in about 48 hours, you know. Farms and, and mountains, and I just love it here, man. Southern born, southern bred. When I die, I'll be southern dead. Smoke it, Johnson. 
I was actually born, yes, James Harrell Fanning. I wrestled under Jimmy Valentine, Jimmy McDonald, uh, Big John Valen, Jimmy the Body Valen, and then finally in 69, uh, I went to uh, Texas and Fritz Von Eric and named me handsome Jimmy Valiant. I'm handsome Jimmy Valiant, the Booger Wooger Man. And I tell my people, my brothers and sisters, don't you dare, don't you dare miss this one. We gonna be balling, squalling, climb the wall. Old time Jubilee, blood's gonna flow like wine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was born in 1942 and uh, started wrestling in 1942, really. I mean, I hit the ground wrestling, brother. I started wrestling in uh, 1964. This is 2004, it's been 40 years, and uh, this is my farewell tour, and uh, me and my lovely wife, Angel, every Sunday we cross off an X. Every week I look at it and I said, man, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna keep going. And hey, if God lets me, another uh, seven months, brother, is gonna happen. Well, you know, it's just a goal I set in my mind, and uh, hey, Social Security kicks in, and, and uh, I made a lot of money, but man, I, you know, I blew a lot of money too, you know, but it, hey, it's time to stop. So I'm very fortunate to be able to go out on my terms 40 years. I uh, had two complete different careers because I was a handsome Jimmy Valiant and I was a, a bad cat man, you know, a rough guy. And uh, then in the 80s, I said, it's time to move on. So I grew a beard and started singing and dancing and kissing people and thinking of stuff uh, different, you know. Man, the boogie woogie when man was born, and that was for uh, the crowd pleaser for the next 20 years, you know. Hello, y'all. How you doing, my man? Back in my mind, I says, when I retire, I want to do a wrestling camp. And uh, I'm going to help these kids. I did a little earlier than I expected. There you go, son. No, not yet, man. I just, I just got in from 700 miles, man. Just we rode last Whoa. night from uh, Arkansas. So uh, my man, Jim. Uh, this is going to be uh, our, our 12th year. September the 12th, and it'll be our 12th graduation class, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is all family here, man. It's all family. Brother. My kids keep me involved in it, and also I'm writing a book, and I'm going to tour with that, and so uh, I'll never get out of it, you know. Boogie Woogie, he was like my first favorite wrestler, so it's awesome to come up here and wrestle for my favorite wrestler. Good, I love it. How long you been uh, training, but uh, three or four years. Huh? My first pro match was with Charlie Fulton in uh, high school in Connecticut. He was really nice, you know, like giving me pointers and helping me out. In the locker room, there's the Iron Sheik, Dolo the Butcher, Professor Tanaka was there. Here I am, just sitting in the corner, right, soaking in all that's going on. When you're a novice, you don't have the, the awareness. I think I was pretty lost. You're in the ring with the, the blinders on. The only thing I really remember about the match itself was that 
at one point, Charlie got me up against the ropes and whacked me with a forearm. And I said, boys, I, I thought this was supposed to be fake. And then in the same night, uh, Ted Arcidi hit Hillbilly Cousin Luke over the head with a chair and uh, busted him open the hard way. I'm like, well, stitches are no big deal because they just sew you up and then it heals. You know, I had no, no second thoughts. I left with a good feeling, so I was invigorated by the whole experience, ready to learn more. Where you really hit the gym. One of the guys I met was the Bear Man while he was in Pittsburgh, and he had a territory up in uh, Ontario. And in these one particular time I went, I happened to see uh, a guy named Jimmy Valiant, and along with Bobby Heenan, who these fellows were wrestling in the Indianapolis territory. And Heenan spotted me and figured that, boy, I'd make a good partner for uh, Jimmy Valiant. Then he approached Dick the Bruiser in Indianapolis, the promoter and a great wrestler, to uh, consider that. And um, they brought me out there as Jimmy's brother with flowers and young girls. And, you, know. you know, you look at my brother Luscious and you look at myself handsome, baby. We got 60 inch chest, but our waist is 32. You look at the deltoids, you look at the biceps, you look at the trapezes. You lift, look at the Valiant Brothers. You're looking at men. We had like uh, four or five weeks to talk about Johnny before anybody seen him. Luscious Johnny, man, he's the roughest cat. He's the biggest cat. He's the best looking cat. And when Johnny walked down the aisle first time in Indianapolis, they were throwing beer on us, and you know, I mean, it was, it was two big blondes walking down, and oh, it just took off. It just was on fire. So I had some outfits made to correspond with his already established gimmick for appearance, that is. The sayings on the back or whatever were basically, a lot of them were my ideas. Yeah, Star Wars, Moneymaker, uh, Macho, I Love Johnny or something. Or I Am a Star instead of Star, I Am A and then a Star. So in those days, nobody else was doing that. And so I guess we kind of set a precedence at that point. And the flamboyancy was kind of picked up as, a, as we went. When I got into it, uh, to be Johnny Valiant, I, I didn't follow a script, you know. Nobody wrote me a script as to what this guy should be. Larry the Axe Henning and, and them, they, in Minneapolis, they said they were like a fast-talking cab driver kind of guy. Maybe a used car lot kind of a guy. Jimmy said to me, I can't wait until tomorrow morning. And I said, why is that, Jim? And he says, because I get better looking every day. And uh, I said, well, just go to sleep and everything will be cool. And uh, he woke up, and sure enough, it was a little better than it was at midnight. Is that something? When you incorporate the blonde hair and the sunglasses or whatever, you know, you don't do all that stuff to be quiet. And then there was a match with uh, Bruno San Martino and Dick the Bruiser pitted against Johnny and uh, Jimmy Valiant, the Valiant brothers. They stood for uprighteousness, whereby these two blonde guys were totally off the wall. Midwest type town. Here comes these guys from New York or whatever. Yeah. Who are they? We beat San Martino and Dick the Bruiser there, and that put us on the wrestling map as a tag team. Super 
Aguela. And oh, Queen of Wrestling. How did she become Queen of Wrestling? And why am I the princess? The Olympic Auditorium. Maybe back in the day it was uh, like a Carnegie Hall for them in the Bronx, but it's this run-down, paint-peeling place. Where are the women? No, it's this one, it's on a stick. There's not many girls that do the pro wrestling. There was really not too much interest in it. Mocha will be in her corner, I'll be in your corner. Mm -hmm. You go at it. Mm -hmm. I'll be bothering her. I mean, you're knocked out. Right, mm -hmm. oh, I'm out. Go ahead and have so I have to go in the ring. Who, who knocks me out? They'll hire a girl. The girl doesn't know how to work. I don't even think she's licensed, because you don't have to be licensed in other states. Because you can kick me right on the bubble. And then this is it. This is soft. This is yeah. That's fine. If I need you, or if I do run. She's got a pair of tits and something that looks like a wrestling outfit. Sky girl, girl sky work. You better tell them this whole thing one more time in front of him. Otherwise, the minute he sees her knocked out, he's gonna. Are your workers or girls that know how to wrestle? They've actually gone to schooling and they put in time in the ring. Are you gonna leave these in? The other girls, the show girls, the titty girls, the valets, they're the most dangerous kind to work with. They had us backstage for like, felt like, I think it was three hours. It was the middle of February or March, it was freezing, there was no heat in the building. No water, no food, the place was freezing, we're standing around for three hours in costume. Uh, curse and uh, telepain. Los Angeles Guardianes, the Guardian Angels. Oh, see, see, see. Guardian Angels! Everybody wants to be a star and everybody wants to put on a good show. It was the, the worst. <laughs> they had spent like $2,000 on fireworks. They went off like. For that, they could have paid us a little more. There was like 40 people in the seats and most of them were up in the balcony because the balcony are the cheap seats. There's only so much a person to take. It's, it, you know, it's very uh, heartbreaking. I try to stick with what we talked about. I try to stay with the storyline. And um, she just didn't know what to do or work. We called some spots. She messed them all up. And to top it all off, after waiting and seeing the incredible firework display, she's wearing the street boots. I get kicked in the groin hard. I've, I've never gotten kicked that hard before in my life. If somebody gives me a potato, that's when they fuck up and they, they hurt you for real, I give them potatoes back. I smacked her across her back and her head went, wow! Whiplash! That's the only way they learn. It's like a bad dog, you have to teach them. I thought I was gonna be in the WWF and I'd be traveling with McMahon and you know, I was going to marry Big Daddy Diesel at the time, <laughs> you know, confess. Um, we all do, you know, we'll mark out in the beginning. She went boom with that heel. Shit. Lucky I don't got nuts, man. I'm sorry about that. I'm in the stiffy line. You stiffy line in my pussy. Everything else is okay. The people that succeed, they succeed because they keep believing it. I think somewhere along the line, I, I stopped believing it. Yeah, I think that's why I didn't make it, you know? We're going to stores. Cowtown. Yukon Huskies. Last day of class. Student presentations. Classes, graduate level sport management. So I have eight students 
five master students and three PhD students. One of the things that I stress is define your core business. You think about it in a wrestling promotion. Are you in the business of selling t-shirts? Are you in the business of uh, soap opera, burlesque? What do you do? Campus is pretty empty during the summer. Manchester Hall, good seminars, pondering the intricacies of postmodern cultural theory. I did my undergrad at Wesleyan University, went to grad school at the University of Florida, and did my PhD at University of Connecticut. Seems like a long time ago now, but it's nice to uh, be here under different circumstances. Okay. Number one. It's a good group of students, you know, real good group. Their primary business is the adult training and athletic speed development. And second, they have a health club service. Uh, you learn a lot about people by teaching them. To improve their quality of life. And you learn a lot about yourself. When you start out, students don't have the skills, and at the end of the semester, put something together. It's gratifying and fun. You know, we're not imparting technical skills. Mm -hmm. We're selling motivation. And, you know, we're kind of skirting around these issues, right, of feeling motivated. So if we can really focus on that feeling, you know, I can give everybody A's, eight people in the class. You know, my grandma always told me, if you can make a career out of a hobby, that's the smart way. In kind of a backwards way, that's what I'm doing. I uh, can make a career out of writing about wrestling. In two days, I'm going to Pullman, Washington to teach at Washington State University. And I showed up at, at Ruby's job, and they just had a big luncheon for her for leaving. I had my, my shredded shorts, you know, guinea tea, and, uh, uh, you know, the cigar in my mouth. And I walk up, hey, honey, you got the keys? They say, wait a second, this is a professor? Hopefully I'm taking my wife with me, unless she's so tired of listening to my bullshit. Although, she's got to realize that we're going to be in a truck for 14 days. This is good for me. You guys want anything? <laughs> and she's never really heard me talk about wrestling. Especially on a hot day like today. She better make sure there's fresh batteries for portable CD because Washington's a long drive. And I got a lot of stories. We're going to be living right on the Idaho border in northern Idaho. So actually, there's a show September 4th in Bozeman, Montana. AWA is running there. I'm trying to get booked on a show. Johnny Reeves helped me out a little bit. Hi, how you doing? Hello. Pound the Can you spice that? You pick your ways that you you're spoiled. For me, it's it's food and gyms. That's where I spend my money. I don't go out to nightclubs. I don't drink a lot. That's probably the Italian heritage. If I eat well and get enough exercise, and I feel good. Strongest guy that I've ever worked out with. You know, you lift weights and you know people who lift weights and don't take steroids and they work really hard and you see what they look like, right? And then you look at another guy who looks clearly different and you say, you know, he can't say, well, I, work, I train really hard and take a lot of steroids. He's got to say, you know, uh, I'm genetically dispositioned. Yeah to take steroids. <laughs> he wrestled in high school, wrestled in college. He was the New England heavyweight champion. This is in uh, Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, Promoters uh, like that slam. match. It's good TV. Says it's over. Oh, he missed. I'm having a good time here. Down goes Sean Summers. Oh, oh, oh gosh. Oh. I think when I was a kid, I didn't know how to play too well. I always just wanted to win. And now I think I'm much better at playing. The winner of the match is Sean Summers. Oh, 
Belay. Briscoe did a great job. Back after this, the Southern Championship Wrestling. <laughs> Just like Larry, he loves himself. <laughs> I'm going to go outside, and when I come back, there better not be any balloons on this bed. Otherwise, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Really bad. <laughs> there are balloons on the bed. Some students come down from Connecticut, that was touching. Spent six weeks in the classroom, and, and then they're driving that distance to see you off. Sociology, a sociological aspect. That was a, a good mix of uh, a couple of wrestlers and then uh, family. You know, cold beer, good food, and uh, kids to play with. I think that's something that for a long time I aspired to be but it didn't know how to, how to do it. Just being, you know, really personally happy, happily married, very rewarding career, very rich uh, family life, social life, you know, having a good time. It's all about the smile. Moving is always, uh, it's mixed emotions, and it's all about the sadness. Because you feel a loss of not being near people you care about. In feeling that sadness, there's a certain warmth and comfort because it shows how deep the feelings are. I was so sad that I was happy. Overcome with emotion. But I, I was feeling the emotion in a different way. It came out in smiles. I live on the west side uh, in New York, on the west 51st between 8th and 9th. It's a uh, SRO, single room occupancy, and that's kind of the way I like it. It affords me the opportunity to be here in Manhattan, and my rent is very, very reasonable. And I also affords me the fact that I have uh, freedom of movement. And I just have a real nice little humble little room with a window and a uh, little black and white TV, a little radio. I listen to talk shows and whatnot, and go down the hall and take a nice shower and uh, shave, and uh, it's kind of nice, and out the door I go. Gearing up for the big show tonight, Johnny Valiant, third go round, Niagara, East Village. I was introduced to uh, Evan Ginsberg. Yeah, she paid already. She paid already. I publish Wrestling Man and Now. We're part of WrestlingManandNow.com, JohnnyValiant.net. Evan's been a good buddy of mine and uh, wrestling fan. It was a positive experience. That's how I met Johnny Valiant. Okay, and presently you are managing him. Yes. He kind of has enlightened me now as to keeping up pace with all the other wrestlers huh? by way of merchandising and the tapes for sale and, and, and the t-shirts. And... Johnny Valiant is one of the most talented people on this planet, one of the funniest guys. I'm not saying this to butter him up, you know, and I, we're going to take him right back to the top. The man so he's been kind of managing me and stuff, getting my, my appearances, right, basically right all of it by way of the have, internet. Uh, many celebrities in the audience, we're going to introduce them a little later. The legend, Johnny Valiant. Yeah. Back in my days, we didn't have beepers over here and cell phones and internets and all, but, but you have to understand, I've kind of been out away from this business for a while. So after I finished here in New York in the WWF wrestling, I had to take it upon myself that I got to go do something else in my life. So I'm kind of getting my, you know, one toe at a time back into the water. Well, you know, you've been plodding along seven some odd years here and doing uh, very meager roles in movies and television and whatnot. How long are you going to give yourself? How long do you... When you're my age, yeah. there's only so much work out there. If you watch television, you can see it's usually 20, 30s, and 40s. And so, that kind of narrows things down. I gotta say, though, it finally dawned on it. I ain't gonna ever quit, man. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Uh, it's a big city. There's a lot of people. I really don't have the leverage that I had in wrestling. Because once you quit, that would you do anyhow. 
So I'm really out there all by myself. After wrestling, it's probably the biggest adjustment in my life. Life, as it has a way of humbling us, it also is always bringing about changes. And tomorrow, Monday, I'll be an extra in a movie called Taxi, as one of the taxi drivers. Would I like to be a principal tomorrow? Yes. Tomorrow is just a, a job. They can wrap me after eight hours so I can get some overtime or whatever. And I go back to my uh, little room there, and then that's it. It's okay to be humbled now and then. Go on with the flow. Come on, I'm